Excellent. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Kevin Delaney. Uh, I am the Director of Solutions Architecture at Security Compass in Toronto. Uh, sorry, is, is, oh, there we go. A little closer. Okay. Uh, I'm the Director of uh, Solutions Architecture at Security Compass in Toronto. Uh, we actually host the uh, OWASP chapter in Toronto very often. Uh, we uh, have had a lot of really good participation over the last few years uh, of hosting and uh, obviously very excited to be here to, uh, to see you all in London. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, heroes versus villains. The idea of building an application security program that scales. So essentially how to build a good AppSec program using resources that you already have. Um, I'm sure you've seen enough presentations that start with a slide like this. Um, over 160 million credit cards compromised in the last seven years um, from logos like NASDAQ, JetBlue, JCPenney, Target, Home Depot. They have all suffered serious consequences from uh, a failure to properly secure their applications. And no doubt every time something like this makes the news, people in here probably get a little uncomfortable. Probably squirming your seat a little. Is that gonna happen to my company? Am I going to be the one that gets yelled at for this? Um, I mean, the best way that you can possibly kind of avoid that feeling is by getting security built in as early as possible. So what is the difference between a, vil a villain and a hero? A villain is proactive. They prepare early, they gather intelligence, and they have a game plan. You gotta think like a villain. The people that are out to attack your company, they're out to attack your application, they have a game plan. And then when that game plan fails, they have another game plan. I'm sure you guys have all kind of experienced this before. Uh, you know your target, you know their weaknesses, and you know how to exploit them. Now, everybody kind of loves the hero on their team. The guy that's always gonna step up and save the day when something goes wrong. You don't necessarily want heroes on your team all the time. You want villains on your team, the people that are proactive. The heroes are still a, a useful asset, but with the right preparations in place, a hero is not going to have too many worlds to save. So this analogy is really about the difference between uh, being proactive versus reactive in working with security requirements in your application lifecycle. So, although nomenclature is going to vary between waterfall, agile, DevOps, CI, CD, most software development processes ultimately boil down to something like this. We have a requirements phase. That's where we establish what do we want this application to do? How do we want it to function? How do we want it to perform? From there, we design our application and it goes into development. Now, we will use applications like Fortify, things like that, that would uh, perform static analysis. I'm sure you guys have all worked with tools like this before. You check your code, look for vulnerabilities, look for weaknesses. Um, the problem with this is it's already too late in terms of cost and time to remediate vulnerabilities. Down here in the testing phase, that's even later. That by the time we have already written code and we're then pen testing our application and finding vulnerabilities, <coughs> getting that big laundry list of problems that I'm sure you guys have all received before, that's already too late. I don't even know what to say about getting into the release phase because that's even later. Um, I want you to think of an application that's been your problem child. Maybe that one that was already built when you first took on your role. Um, maybe one with risk that you kind of reluctantly accepted so that it made it into production, you met your deadline. Um, where was security really being considered first? Were you finding things kind of in the static analysis or in the development side of things, or were you finding them even worse in the testing side? The longer you wait to identify vulnerabilities, the more time and effort it costs to actually remediate them. So why does this happen? One really important thing is sometimes we have inexperienced developers. Um, schools do not teach proper secure development uh, practices. 
Um, I mean, I went to school for network security. I took coding courses. Uh, I never actually learned secure coding. And I mean, judging by the way some people in the room are shaking their heads, I, I don't think they have either. You're, you get involved with something like OWASP because you have a personal interest in security. You see the personal effect that it has on you and your job when you might have written insecure code. You're personally proud of the applications that you write and you understand the risks that could happen if you don't uh, write securely. Um, the attitude has often been, well, that's what we have security architects for, if you're a developer. Creates this kind of mentality of us versus them when you're a developer and you have uh, that kind of security department that you can throw things over the fence to, which I'm sure some of you are that security department and you know what that's like. Um, similarly, I mean, there's inexperience and then there's just straight up apathy where you don't even really care about secure development. Um, I mean, senior developers get set in their ways. Uh, many people have been doing this for years and years uh, since the days of Fortran and BBS systems and uh, trying to shift their habits now is often an uphill battle. It's very hard to do. Um, I mean, just like how you may not always lock your front door when walking to the shop on the corner until someone breaks into your house. And then suddenly it's uh, a little bit more important. It's easier for you to care about that once something has happened to you, once you've experienced it. So that is just human nature, not understanding the ramifications until you really get that negative impact. Um, that is a, another big reason that insecure code makes it into applications. Overwhelming requirements documents. Um, I don't know, in large development teams and some of the organizations that I've, I've kind of worked with, security requirements documents are these big, ugly 300 page documents that say, here's how to code securely. And every time the next poodle or heart bleed or shell shock comes out, we add another couple bullet points onto that document. And everybody's just expected to, to know what it is. Um, the problem is nobody really reads them. As uh, <laughs> Again, I'm seeing lots of heads nodding. Um, nobody reads these documents and it becomes really unmanageable. And really, it's not even possible for you to remember all of the things that you have to consider in terms of security if it's just living in this big, thick document. Um, so, I mean, developers are very deadline driven. You don't, you get absorbed by your work you have deadlines to meet. For you to go and maybe open some big document to try to figure out security if you are not as security minded as some people in the room might be, it's very difficult. And that's how insecure code makes it into applications. And also too much reliance on static and dynamic analysis tools. Uh, the whole idea of, well, AppScan will take care of it or Fortify will take care of it. Don't get me wrong, they're super important. You have to have them, but I mean, who here has seen a list from Fortify or AppScan where you get 2,000 findings and we say, okay, we need a couple weeks to chew through this now. <laughs> um, when you have kind of armed yourselves and armed your developers with the information that you need to do things right the first time, uh, you, the, the results that come out of these tools become much more manageable. Um, even if you're using every static and dynamic analysis tool that's available at the same time, the absolute maximum coverage you're gonna get is about 60%. So what about that other 40%? What about when your application gets compromised because of that? So food for thought on, on how insecure code makes it in. So there's a number of obstacles that, I mean, developers and executives are facing uh, in today's security landscape. Um, one of them in particular that I, I see a lot is IoT. Everybody is connecting everything to the internet, whether it should be or not. Fridges and microwaves and locks on doors and, I mean, you have everyday objects that are now being exposed to the internet and now exposed to countless vectors of attack. Like, this is new territory. This is not something that we've been doing for the last 10 years. IoT is the cool new thing but nobody really has a good kind of library of security practices on how to properly secure Internet of Things applications. This is a huge obstacle that people are facing right now. So how is your superhero, if you have that hero on your team, 
how are they going to react in this completely new space? They're going to be left to figure things out on their own. Because the villains are already figuring out how to attack it. You look at any hacking conference like DEF CON or Black Hat, um, look at the lock picking villages. People are fascinated by picking physical locks and getting into stuff. When you kind of present an IoT device, something that impacts the real world, not just like a web browser, for example, that gets hackers excited. I know it gets me excited. When you get to like, you have a Bluetooth lock and you get to pop it open all of a sudden, it gets people excited. It gets, it gets villains motivated. And the only way to get ahead of that is by thinking like a villain. So if you are, if you or your company are getting into the IoT space, for example, this is something you really, really need to think about is figuring out your security requirements for how to build this right the first time. Another really big thing is compliance. Uh, I mean, I'm from Canada. I don't have to worry about the GDPR too much, but um, I, I, I've heard <laughs> that it's uh, quite, a big, uh, quite a big issue here in the UK and Europe right now. Um, if you are now being faced with all these new compliance drivers that your applications have to meet, whether it's PCI, GDPR, uh, ISO 27000, uh, this is now introducing additional levels of complexity for your developers and security teams. You can have this document that comes to you from the European Privacy Commission. You say, okay, here developers, go ahead. And you kind of get this deer in the headlights look and, and you're only gonna find out it's done wrong when the auditors tell you so. So this is all stuff you have to be getting ahead of. Figuring out how to distill these requirements that come from these big documents down into individual actionable tasks. Um, those are just a couple things. I mean, I could, I could go on on some of the others, but I think those are two of the biggest things that I'm seeing uh, in the, the businesses that I speak with on a day-to-day -day basis right now. Um, so, I mean, how do you actually solve this? It's all well and fine to say, I mean, you, you can build new security requirements, but at the end of the day, the struggle is real because you need to Pinpoint vulnerabilities before cyber criminals do. You need to meet your customer requirements and the ever-changing compliance standards that are coming down the pipe all the time. Privacy is like one of the biggest things in the news right now. And the only way to do that is with time, skills, and security talent. Um, good help is hard to find. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we have a room full of very capable and, and uh, motivated people here for security. But at the end of the day, companies everywhere struggle to find experienced IT security practitioners, and it leaves the smart minds like you guys to kind of step up and figure things out. Um, there was a recent Poneman study done uh, in, uh, in North America last year. 70% of respondents believe their organization does not have enough IT security staff. 36% of security positions went unfilled by the end of the year. And for senior security positions, typically requiring a CISSP or, or some level of uh, senior security credentials, 58% of those were unfilled. So that is putting a lot of strain on the people that are uh, having to kind of juggle security for their organization. And it all boils down to a shallow talent pool, basically. Uh, there's a lack of talent because there are limited resources to scale information security across applications. Um, that doesn't allow you to manage things that are coming down your pipe like uh, compliance and IoT and, and the other blue bubbles that I showed you there. Um, that's not gonna make that any easier. Uh, I mean, the numbers are pretty clear. Last year, 32% were unfilled. They're predicting this year 60% of positions not filled. The security crunch is real. So how do we do something about it? Well, there's a couple numbers here. Demand for InfoSec jobs is growing 3.5 times faster than other jobs, than other IT jobs, and 12 times faster than all jobs. 12,000 InfoSec professionals surveyed believe that talent shortage weakened their defenses. And 70% of companies surveyed in the United States believe their IT security department is understaffed. There's 50,000 CISSP postings in the US alone, but only 60,000 CISSPs worldwide. I mean, you don't need to be a genius to do that math. Uh, it's, there is a massive crunch for senior security talent. 
And even here in the UK, it's an expensive endeavor. I mean, the average security architect salary in the United Kingdom is 75,000 pounds. 114,000 US dollars in, in North America. Um, that's before you even consider onboarding and training and all the costs that it takes to actually hire somebody. That's just their salary. So companies need to learn how to do more with less, essentially. Because, I mean, ultimately, employers want certified domain experts with multiple years of experience in things like network security governance, policies, procedures. Um, and then in order to deal with the lack of talent, they end up taking a risk-based approach and they just deploy their skilled security analysts in only the most critical of applications. Well, it's not only the critical applications that attackers go for. It's the low-hanging fruit that might, might be some legacy code that hasn't been touched in five, 10 years. Uh, or, or possibly less uh, in, in really fast-paced environments. So this leaves hundreds, if not thousands of projects severely underserved by inter information security. So basically, we need to learn how to do more with less. Um, your security team cannot be the only people that get relied on for security. Um, what ultimately needs to happen is you need to identify security champions within your development team and empower them. Make developers care about security. Um, when you incentivize them with security training certifications, an OWASP membership, uh, these are all transferable skills. These are all things that, um, although yes, it's gonna get them personally excited because it looks great on LinkedIn, looks great on their resume, um, it is going to make them feel like you care about their personal development and their career growth, and they're gonna to wanna to stay with you because they're now in a position of responsibility on their development team. You ultimately need to teach your heroes to think like villains. Um, one way to do this uh, is, as I said, with, with certifications. We've seen um, a, lot of, a lot of our customers and people that we engage with in the industry um, empower their developers with something like the CSSLP. Um, so the Certified Secure Software Lifecycle Professional. That's not necessarily just teaching secure code, that's teaching secure application lifecycle practices. How to manage that in, in a corporate environment or even in your own company that you might work with developing software. How to do things right from the start. You reduce costs, you reduce your application vulnerabilities, uh, and ultimately delivery delays. Um, and it lets you ensure that secure software is accepted and delivered effectively. Um, I've personally seen the benefit that incentivizing developers with certs, not just CSSLP, but certs in general, security-focused uh, certifications, I mean, for an organization to pay three, four hundred dollars for you to go, or, or 250 pounds for someone to go write a certification. That's a lot cheaper than having to go hire security practitioners and pay them wages and benefits and all those different costs you have associated with it. So being able to empower your existing developers and incentivize them is an easy way to kind of scale your AppSec program. So what makes a great AppSec program? First of all, a great AppSec program needs to be adaptable. Um, the security landscape is changing all the time. Your program needs to be ready to tackle tomorrow's challenges, not just today's. Because it is changing so fast, you need to be ready for whatever comes tomorrow. When the next IoT or the next big internet wave comes around and everybody's rushing to develop applications for something, you have to be ready for that. Um, it's extremely clear that managing security procedures and requirements in wikis, PDFs, SharePoints, Excel documents, doesn't work, it's not enough. There's too much info and not enough time to go through it all. Um, the constant barrage of new threats and compliance drivers has seen these types of documents grow to completely unmanageable sizes and the people consuming them have difficulty finding exactly what they have to do to write securely. Um, it also needs to be adaptable to unforeseen personnel changes. When somebody like the people in the room here leaves the company, what do they do? When you're the only one that knows how to implement things securely, when you're the one that knows that the requirement for dealing with uh, cross-site request forgeries on page 246 of your security requirements, um, that is a, something that you have to be mindful of. You have to make sure that it's scalable. You can't rely on your one rock star 
security engineer to know everything for your business. So um, having it be adaptable to personnel changes is super, super important. Um, ultimately, you should have a goal of creating a security culture, not just a security program. Um, I spoke a bit earlier about making better use of your Rockstar employees, you know, the people that you can enable with certs and, and uh, incentivize with career growth, things like that. Um, this is where it comes into play. So proper management of these three items is really helping you do more with less and making your program more adaptable. Security, a good security program is also focused. So you are focused on the strengths of the people participating. Um, ideally, your security tasks should be generated on the fly and delivered directly to developers. They should not have to go through SharePoint or PDFs to find out how to code securely. We should be telling them directly in JIRA or TFS or Rally, whatever platform you use to, to manage your tasks, we should be telling them exactly how to, uh, how to code securely the first time so we're not finding vulnerabilities later on. Um, ultimately, at the end, it ensures nothing's missed and it reduces the time spent searching for what's applicable to the project by multitudes. So something like this, if you had developers receiving security tasks, avoid DOM-based cross-site scripting, always perform your input validation on the server, things like that. If you had individual tasks that were telling you how to code securely the first time, um, I mean, that is a way better approach than getting someone to kind of filter through a PDF document. And then they can see a task, something like avoiding DOM-based cross-site scripting, and a code sample. Give it to them right then and there. It's the easiest way to scale an application security program because you can be a team of 10 or you can be a team of 10,000. And as long as it's the same instruction that's going out to everybody, it, it doesn't matter if you started with the company five minutes ago or five years ago, you're gonna be following the same instructions to do things right the first time. Um, ultimately, you want your security program to be collaborative. Um, you wanna get rid of the us versus them mentality between developers and security. Um, it breeds an environment where developers often don't understand the importance of security itself as much as they understand keeping those pesky security guys off their backs. Um, you want it to be uh, something where they are personally invested and personally care about security. Um, and that's, I mean, developers taking responsibility for security tasks. Um, it's when a, when a well-respected member of a development team becomes a security champion, uh, it promotes the culture of security. Um, it's, uh, when you have the us versus them mentality with a security team, developers are more likely to listen to one of their own who might be saying, hey guys, maybe we should bind our variables in our SQL statements. We should probably do that. And when someone says, how do I do that? That's way better than getting an email or a rejection or getting code sent back to you by a security team saying, hey, you broke this, go fix it. <laughs> Having that instruction the first time from one of your peers as a developer, you're way more likely to take that in a positive light. Um, it gets rid of the kind of antagonistic culture between developers and security. Um, one thing that I've seen really successful is having your developers host a security, like someone that you've identified as a security champion, host a security focused, I don't know if you guys have the concept of lunch and learn in the UK, okay, cool. Um, a security focused lunch and learn uh, on a regular basis to teach security concepts. If your company has that mentality of us versus them between developers and security, um, let your developers do it. Let your senior developer lead a security session once a week. Pay for lunch. The, co the cost of paying for lunch for those people versus the cost of remediating uh, security vulnerabilities or hiring security staff is very, very, very small. Um, for the people in here that aren't necessarily uh, executives or CISOs, encourage your management to do this. Say, hey, I'm taking responsibility for security. Let me lead a session. You bring the sandwiches or pizza or whatever, I will teach security once a week. And it, it helps you feel better. You know you're doing something good for your application and for ultimately for your company overall. Um, this type of collaborative nature is really what makes a good application security program. So 
essentially a recap of what I went over. So <coughs> the proper management of security requirements early in the SDLC prevents problems before they happen and it turns down the noise from your static and dynamic analysis tools. Those big 10,000 result fortify findings goes down to maybe like 100. Much easier when your developers are armed with the instruction to do things right the first time. Deliver these requirements directly to developers in the tools that they use every day. I know as a, de as a developer and from developers that I've spoken to, having management or somebody come to you and say, oh, by the way, here's this new thing you have to log into, and if you could do that like every day, that'd be awesome. Um, that's not typically very well received. Um, when you are a developer, you're working out of your ALM, you're working at a JIRA or Rally or TFS, whatever, give them their security requirements directly in their ALM tools because that's where they're going to see it and that's where there's accountability. If they say it's done in their ALM, just like any other functional requirement, designing an interface, putting a button in, handling form input, I mean, there's accountability there. And you can track it, your project managers and scrum masters can assign it out. That is the best place for security requirements to go. And leverage and empower your existing resources because finding new ones is no easy task. You people in the room should not be threatened by this idea. You should be really excited about this idea because it makes your jobs easier. Um, I know I have received, in my previous roles, I've received emails of, oh my gosh, Kevin, help me fix this, or uh, Kevin, why are you telling me this is done wrong? Um, when you have created a culture of security, you are going to be seen as kind of that champion, that, that smart resource, and ultimately become a leader on your team. You'll have more things to put on your resume as someone who can grow within the organization or even start to create more of a security organization inside your company. And ultimately, you want to make sure your AppSec program is adaptable, focused, and collaborative. Adaptable to the latest trends and changes, focused on delivering it to the people in the way that they actually need to receive it or the way they work on a day-to-day -day basis, and collaborative. So taking advantage of everybody's strengths uh, inside the organization in order to deliver secure software and do things right the first time. Reducing vulnerabilities, moving left in the software security lifecycle. And that's all, thank you very much. Okay, um, question. So we have a Q&A session while the next uh, speaker is preparing his presentation. Any questions? Stephen Mason from Barclay Card. A brilliant presentation, by the way, so thank you very much for that. Thank you. I would also extend this to also highlight certain individuals in the organisation, certain roles, for example, business analysts, project managers, and directors, who don't quite understand the security aspect. And so we're going to start challenging developers on their uh, mandates on actually developing and actually putting pressure on them to reduce that and therefore potentially reducing security. So that's the front part of it. And obviously the end part, if it certainly is like a waterfall approach, they always sort of run out of time to do the testing, they potentially run out of time to do the dynamic analysis as well. Um, not necessarily so much for the Agile, because obviously Agile testing all the time, and they can actually appreciate and reduce the actual cost and actually give full management up front of the smaller blocks, how long it's going to take, but certainly just think about the business analysts who haven't been trained and doesn't actually, might be old and don't quite understand security, certainly the, uh, the senior management and so forth, it's that sort of situation as well. A absolutely, yeah. Um, th thank you for that, for that comment. Um, one thing that I see, uh, first of all, and I'm not just saying this because I'm at an OWASP conference, um, focusing, if you have a not very mature AppSec program, focusing on the OWASP top 10, which you all know is kind of the low-hanging fruit in any application, that is going to cover so many bases for you and it's going to um, kind of take you out of the, uh, the, the potential target line of many attackers. If you are just getting started with the people that, um, that might not necessarily be as technical, they might be older, or they might uh, not be <laughs> as, uh, as knowledgeable about security, give them basic OWASP top 10 training. Say, here's these 10 things you need to learn. You don't need to understand them, you just need to know that it's important that we prevent these. And then when we get to, I mean, a lot of the other kind of things outside of the OWASP top 10 
way deeper technical concepts, cross that bridge when you come to it. Get them started kind of with the OWASP top 10 and say, get a good understanding of this. Look at the, the, the studies that are out there from researchers that I won't name, but uh, things that say the longer you wait in the software development life cycle to identify or find a vulnerability, it, it, I mean, but if you're waiting by the time it's released, it's on average about 100 times more expensive than if you did it right the first time. Show them numbers like that when it comes to delayed releases and cost savings, and those are the things that will really resonate with them. Any more questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kalik Patel, uh, MLI Group. First of all, I really enjoyed your presentation, and I think you made a very, very good um, uh, case as to why uh, the initiative should be taken from within. Um, let me just add more to that. Um, in your analysis, and the way you described uh, uh, the villains, actually the, the threat landscape today isn't just coming from the criminals. Some of you people know what we're doing. It's coming from the, uh, the cyber terrorists with the destruction motivation. Absolutely. Now, when you add that, and this is probably more relevant to the, um, to the developers who, and the, and the uh, people in, in the attendance, <clears throat> if you think of how you make yourself more valuable to the organization by implementing some of the suggestions you made, it actually would be far more valuable to the organization than the organization realizes because the threat from the destruction motivation is far greater than you could ever imagine. And quite often, the top decision makers are asleep at the wheel, no disrespect. They have no clue. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've actually, I've, I've given this talk at, at, or a similar talk to this at, at more CISO focused conferences and uh, the number of CISOs at, at household name organizations that kind of wake up to this after hearing something like this is actually really surprising. So. Uh, for people that have a really good relationship with senior <coughs> management, things like that, bring up this idea, bring up the idea of empowering people internally as opposed to trying to hire your way out of every problem. And, and free advice to the attendees here, the greater the value or the brand awareness of your company, the more you will be targeted by these people, and that means you're at greater risk. So the flip side of the coin here is if you allow yourself to get, to get attacked and you are breached, Guess what? It's your head on the line. It's your neck on the line. But if you can help defend it, you're the hero. So that's my my two two cents of advice. Absolutely. Thank you. Next question. Sandy from Virtually Informed. Um, you said two things which, on the surface, may be contradictory, but I'm sure you've got a response to that. But earlier on, you were mentioning about uh, when, when your team starts to code. There's always lots and lots of documentation they've got to go through, whether it's standards, whatever. Lots and lots of paperwork. And yet later on you were talking about how you don't give them uh, sort of things to read, you give them tasks and you identify those tasks, you document those. Now, both of those together are really adding more and more uh, to developers to look at and read, which is what most developers don't like to do. They want to get on and code. They do not want to sit there and read through how and why they should be doing certain things. I think it's, an, it's really important for developers to understand, I mean, why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, when I go back to something like this here, we give a one paragraph explanation of something like this uh, of, of what DOM-based cross-site scripting is, and here's a code sample of how you start to work with it. The first time I read something like that, I'm going to say, okay, okay, I start to understand this now. In the future, that information is going to be there for me. The code sample that my company says is a good idea to use for mitigating this type of thing is going to be there. I don't necessarily need to read this every time. And the other thing too is you don't need to deliver everything all at once either. You can triage security requirements, again, by the OWASP top 10. Cut things down. If you just want to start creating that application security culture, start with the OWASP top 10, or even like five of them to get started. Um, slowly work your way into it. If you all of a sudden show up and dump 300 tasks into JIRA for someone, uh, you're not going to be very well liked. <laughs> it's, and you're not going to get the results you want. So um, being able to triage these tasks by priority and importance, and especially the attack surfaces that might exist with your application, I think is really important to acceptance and, and being able to scale that. Can you go one slide back? 
words. By the way, so two now. Yes. Um, so I'm in the process of building my own app tech stuff into our developers, Jira and Portal, etc. What you are saying is exactly what we're trying to do. In my experience, though, the linking of security concerns, aka your next slide, if you go back to it. One more. Yeah, I think you missed one. Yeah, that one. Uh, the actual linking in of all the detail that you can grab by spidering the OAuth site, etc., is a pain in the ass because trying to encapsulate it so that I can fit it into a JIRA output when I get it from my own tools, etc., and so on, is annoying to say the least. And that, that level of documentation work is not something my team currently can handle. Are you aware of any relatively reputable database of this that isn't necessarily the OS website or if that has one, please advise, so I can actually start, start reporting that in? Find me at the beer section later, and we'll we can we can have that conversation. <laughs> Any more questions, guys? That's okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Kevin. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.